Hello, Max Grossman, Chief Instigator of the El Paso Taxpayer Revolt, and today I'm honored to have as our guest Joe Pickett, who is a former State House representative and knowledgeable about all things transportation. <laughs> However, uh, today we are going to be talking about um, utility bills. Thank you so much for joining us today, Joe. My pleasure, Max. Uh, Joe, why are you suing the city of El Paso? Uh, the short answer is I think <clears throat> the city of El Paso is charging a hidden tax. Uh, state law allows municipalities to charge uh, for certain things that they do for fees, but I noticed a few years ago on a water bill a new $6 charge on the garbage side of your residential bill. I called my city rep, Isabel Salcido at the time, she would not explain. I called Tommy Gonzalez, who I knew, the city manager, and asked him to explain. Uh, neither one of them would. They went uh, silent and dark. And so the only way to get answers was uh, freedom of information, uh, open records requests. Couldn't get a whole lot. So I finally wound up just filing a lawsuit against the city because I believe this was a roundabout way just to have a tax increase by creating this franchise fee on a water bill. The ordinance that created it says and states this is for wear and tear on the streets of the garbage trucks. Now the city of El Paso already collects around $44 million a year um, by picking up the gray bins. They have a $5 fee on your water bill for other environmental charges, that's about $11 million. And then the $6 fee raises about another $13 million. No explanation, it's been three years, and even now, what people I feel friendly with that are elected officials will not explain what the fee is actually for. So this is a $6 franchise fee right. that appears on every water bill of every El Pasoan who has water. Yes. Including commercial businesses. Commercial is even more. Commercial is $20 a month, and you get no services from environmental services in the city of El Paso. I also own a couple of small commercial buildings and I'm paying the fee on that and get nothing in return, absolutely nothing. Okay, and this $6 fee for uh, homeowners and $20 for business owners, That's correct. how much does this lead to each year? How much money are we talking about? The $6 on the residential side raises uh, north of $13 million. Okay. But you put that with the other fees that they collect, and they're using sanitation as a money-making profit machine for the city's budget. And again, cities are allowed to charge fees for services, but they can't use this as a hidden tax. When I did ask for an open records request, and when I tried to get someone to explain the fee, well, we're going to use this for repairing the roads. Then I found out that they've been transferring the money to buy other things within the city budget. I guess the good news is that when I filed the lawsuit, Tommy Gonzalez and company stopped transferring money. I don't know where it all is right now. I haven't still haven't been able to get the city to explain anything, and it's unfortunate that I had to bring a suit and being the government, and I know how that works, being on that side for many years, but the city has been postponing, postponing. Um, they tried to keep me from filing a suit and a year ago in December, the Eighth Court of Appeals ruled in my favor that I did have standing, that I could bring the suit on behalf of all the people that have a water bill. So this isn't for me personally. My, my goal is for them to stop charging the fee, um, even rebate customers, or uh, use it for what it was intended. But I think that that's probably not going to happen. The city collects money for the repairs of the streets other ways. They had a big bond election last year. It just is a way that I believe the former city manager found to generate revenue and kind of keep it even secret from the elected officials. Okay, let's let's talk about the litigation now. Mm -hmm. So you filed suit against the city of El Paso in district court? I did. And uh, when did you do that? 
gosh, now it's it's going on a little over three years. I okay. filed it while D. Marvel was still the mayor. It was in October of 2020, and, and as you know, COVID changed a lot of things, especially the legal system. But what was interesting also to me is that the city attorney at that time, which is still currently the city attorney, kept it from um, the mayor and council for probably over three months. Okay. Did not even let them know. In fact, it wasn't until the new uh, mayor had been elected, I was released from 2021, that they were told there was a suit being filed. Let's repeat that. Carla Neiman is a city attorney who was appointed city attorney uh, during the administration of Dee Margo, and she waited three months to inform city council that you filed a lawsuit. Yeah, and, and during that time, I also found out that at any given point in time, the city has as many as 40 or more lawsuits pending. And I think there is a problem um, that this brought to light, not just the fact that I believe it's an illegal tax that the city's charging. I think that the uh, city attorney's office is keeping this and many things from the city council. Um, I would like people that are watching this to, to call their city representative and ask them about that fee and see what kind of response that they get. I don't know if they're going to tell them I can't respond because it's in suit, but it's a fee that you and I pay and I believe the constituency deserves to know what it's for and what it's being used for. And every year when they, they the city council, adopts a budget, this is $13 million that's going somewhere. And again, as a former lawmaker myself on the state level, I'm not disputing the fact that the city can initiate a fee, but you have to prove it up. You have to state what it's for and use it for that. And if you're not going to use it for that, it's a hidden tax. Any way, shape, or form, I believe that this was created to keep the public from actually knowing and maybe other elected officials. Right. So it's essentially a slush fund. I believe it is. Yes. And it goes into the general fund. It does. And then city staff has control over that, how it's allocated. It does. And there is a similar fee on the water side of your bill. Under Tommy Gonzalez, they created a franchise fee stating that the El Paso water utilities vehicles are wearing and tearing our streets. And there's another $1.33 on that side of the bill. So that that's separate from the suit that I'm currently in, but it's pretty bad when a constituent <coughs> has to file a lawsuit because you can't get a straight answer from either an elected official, city manager, or city attorney. So, you know, I commend you on what you're doing, and, you know, clearly you're suing on behalf of yourself as only one plaintiff, but in a certain sense, you're representing every taxpayer in El Paso. It, it is, because, uh, again, when people have asked me, there, there's not a monetary reward for me at the end of this. It is the city of El Paso spending the money on what they're supposed to be spending it on or not charging the fee because it's determined that it is a hidden tax. Okay. And I believe it is a tax. There's no question about it. It's a tax by any definition. Now, you filed in district court. Take us through the litigation up to where we are right now. There hasn't been a lot because being a government entity as the city and the city attorney's office keeping city council and mayor in the dark, um, the city had filed a motion to throw out my case stating that I did not have the right to sue the government. Well, about a year ago, the 8th Court of Appeals ruled in my favor and said, yes, he does have standing and has the right to sue the city of El Paso on this case. That was a major victory. You it were was. as a citizen to sue the city. And nothing has happened to this point. Uh, we are now you know, nearing the middle of February of 2024. It is scheduled to go to trial April 5th of this year. And my understanding is that you have excellent representation. I do. Um, and I, I am looking forward to uh, April 5th whether we actually go to trial or the city settles, and I have no idea uh, because I've never experienced anything like this. Me being in the government or being on uh, the outside of the government, it's just, 
unbelievable how there's no communication with um, myself and the city, the city elected officials. And again, uh, I know several of them personally. They're completely unaware of what's going on. They know in just some general terms because there has been some minimal media coverage over the last couple of years, and so I know they're aware, but even the, the, the folks that I'm friendly with, I'm a little disappointed that they themselves are not asking the same questions that I'm asking, that any constituent has the right to call up their office or write them or email them and say, please explain the $6 fee on my water bill, explain the $5 fee on my water bill, explain the $19 that you're charging me for the grade bin. Where does all that money go? And I'm a former city council member. I know from my tenure on city council a couple of decades ago that the fee charged for the grade bins is substantial and enough to do what the city needs to do with disposing of that. And during all this time, there's a lot of things that have changed. You and I that want to recycle, we're recycling weekly. Well, that was kind of a bust, and I don't blame the city for something that's happened worldwide. There's not the market for the recyclables. So the city, though, had done away with it completely. The public objected and said, okay, we'll bring it back, but it's every other week. Okay. But there is no fee that was reduced on anything that you and I pay when the city went from once a week to every other week. They have all those people, equipment, personnel, and nothing changed except going up. It, it, it makes no sense. And when you ask an elected official, putting it all into one question, you're doing less, you're charging more, and you're not being upfront and clear about what the fees are for, that's a tax. How about those papers you've got on your lap? You want to show, well, your, show your viewer just uh, again moment where those fees are? If, if you haven't gotten a paper bill in a while because, again, you're busy and you're paying your stuff online, you have an automatic deduction, there are two sides of your utility bill. One is for sanitation and one is for water. And what I'm talking about happens to be the side that the sanitation is on. And there's three fees that you will see on there. There's the $19 for that gray bin. If it's only one, if you have two, there's more than that. Then there's a $5 environmental fee. And that $5 event, environmental fee is supposed to be for anything outside of the gray bins that the city does on our behalf environmentally. No real explanation. I haven't tried to bring suit or question at this point, it's the one below that, the $6 franchise fee. And again, I'm not disputing that the city can't charge a fee, but is it reasonable? Is it really for wear and tear on the streets? Are you taking the $6 that you and I are paying every single month and using it to repair the streets? Most people would say not. If you're taking the $6 and putting it into the general fund and using it to buy police cars or fire trucks or whatever that is, that's a tax. Mm -hmm. You need to come forward and be straight with me and say, I need more money to buy fire trucks or buy police cars. But charging $6 on my garbage bill saying it's for wear and tear in the streets and then giving me no explanation. And Max, it was strange when I'd asked the question how quickly the city shut down. There was not one time where someone said, well, let me explain to you what this is for. They literally shut down the moment I asked. Oh, I have a letter that I wrote to time. I have a letter that I wrote to Isabel Salcido. Neither one of them would reply. Okay. To this day, I've not gotten a reply from the city of El Paso, and that's why I had to file suit. Now, who did you name as defendants? The city of El Paso. So the city, but no individuals, just the city. Well, when you file suit like that, they name the mayor, city council members at that time. Again, when I was on city council, we would get updates from the city attorney's office about who was filing suit on some contract or maybe some litigation regarding a slip and fall or some accident when you were individually named. Because I remember uh, years and years ago actually having been served saying, you know, you're a member of city council, so... But when this was done, it was under a whole 
different administration, and it has not been resolved to this day. And the city, um, quite frankly, has not even attempted to sit down and talk to me about it. I said, well, let's, let's talk about it. What is the relief that you're asking for? Stop the fee. But if you prevail, let's say there's a settlement, are you going to ask for yourself to be reimbursed or for every El Paso to be reimbursed? Every El Paso, because if it were, that's one of the reasons I believe the eight court of appeals ruled in my favor, is this is something that affects every person that is a rate payer or has a uh, water and garbage bill in the city of El Paso. Was that a unanimous three to zero ruling? It was. Wow, so even the Republican, Jeff Alley, was on board. Yes. Wow, that's a mandate. Wonderful, okay. So um, so what, what I would like you, you know, to, to express, you know, since we have the time here, this isn't, you know, cut into 10 seconds. Uh, a lot of people don't care. I know that they're busy. This doesn't bother them. For those that does bother them, pick up the phone and ask your city representative, what are all these fees for? And just don't ask about the $6 one that I'm pointing out. Ask what the $1.33 is on the, the water side. Why, why are you charging that? What are you using it for? What was it created? What was the circumstance? And that's all going to come out eventually in a lawsuit. But why should I even have to do this? Why can't the city of El Paso just explain what they're doing? If they stand behind what it is, answer Right. Let me understand one thing. If you do prevail, and we hope you do, uh, would you be reimbursed for all the fees going back to the time the fee was first levied, all these taxes, including every taxpayer? Do we all get our money back? What is the best and worst case scenario here? I don't know. Uh, to be honest, I don't know. What I have uh, looked at and asked, and it would actually be something that may be determined by the outcome in that court case, but I would go in to trial asking for the fee to be removed and the amount of money collected from its inception to be returned to you and I. Okay. And there are ways to do that because you and I are the city of El Paso. Yes. I'm suing Max Grossman. I'm suing myself. Right. Because I pay this six dollars. To me, supposedly, to people that I have given my trust in to spend it on my behalf. So if we went that route, it would be okay. Then show me a six dollar credit on my bill until that amount is paid back. Right. I mean, this is where the city needs to come forward and, and, and tell me what they can and cannot do because this isn't to hurt the city. This is for them to do the job they were elected to do. The city council is ultimately responsible for this. Tommy Gonzalez may have been a great snake oil salesman, and told them a lot of things. But somebody needed to have stood up and said, is this right? The current city council. We have members on there that weren't a part of this council when the ordinance passed. Nonetheless, the current city council members need to ask this question. I hope it gets asked in the mayoral race at some point. It's not huge. I mean, they're going to get asked questions about, you know, why we have the highest property taxes in the world. You know, what are you going to do for the infrastructure? You know, all the, the money that's being wasted that goes into support the ballpark, all that stuff. Is this a big deal? I think it is because this shows the tip of the iceberg. If the city can get away with this, can you imagine what they're doing? And this is millions of dollars. It may be six bucks a month to a family. But collectively, this is $13 million a year that has no explanation of how it's being spent. And that's just one year. They've been collecting this now since 2018. 2018, right. If you actually add it all up, we're, way, we're, we're, way, past, we're way past $50 million. Oh, yeah. It's if somewhere between 50 and and $100 million, sure. Sure. it's not pocket change. No, it's not. Yeah. So let's talk, uh, let's broaden the conversation a little bit. So the city... 
uh, under the leadership of Tommy Gonzalez and with the tacit approval of mayor and city council back in 2018, back in the D. Margot, Tommy Gonzalez years, uh, starts levying this illegal tax. Let's call it what it is. Uh, now, why would they uh, take such a measure? Why would they go that far to squeeze blood from a lemon and to increase the city revenue by so little? Obviously, this is because the city budget's been under pressure for years. Yes. And that has a lot to do with deficit spending uh, for capital improvement projects, because the city for a while now has been in the business of arenas and stadiums and water parks and all manner of things that go way beyond their traditional purview of police, fire, and roads, correct? Yes, and Max, though, it is, it is big money. And a lot of people have couched me as a transportation person or guru, but I started out as appropriations, and that's why I wound up doing transportation. I was chairman of general government appropriations for the Texas legislature for several years. And I understand when you're looking for money, there's good years, bad years, and when you deal with large numbers, Six dollars, again, six bucks is nothing. You know, there's sports drinks that are getting close to that for a 12-ounce can. But when you have hundreds of thousands of customers monthly, so 100,000 times 12 times six, now that's where the big money comes in. And when you're sitting down and you're looking for $10 million, for whatever reason, good or bad, and, and somebody jumps up and looks left and looks right and says, no one's looking, no one cares. Let's put a $6 fee on their bill. And actually it started off less than that. It right. was four bucks and they did a 50% increase. And who does 50% increases? That's huge. So it went from four to test the waters, I believe. Oh, nobody said anything. Now let's raise it six. The dollar thirty three I mentioned on your water bill, that started off at 77 cents. Now it's a dollar 33. Well, a dollar 33, that's nothing. Times hundreds of thousands of customers, times 12 months a year. Well, again, we're in the millions of dollars, Max. And when you're sitting there moving chess pieces and you're the city manager and you're looking for $5 million to buy more police cars, you're looking for $7 million to pay for some pet project in a couple of districts, this is a big deal, but they need to be doing this out in front during budget hearings, not adding fees like this. There could be others. Right. And I did an open records request. There are, in general, probably dozens of franchise fees. And I understand that because cities, municipalities have the right for cable companies, telephone companies that use their right of way and they pay a fee. And those fees just go into the general fund. And so because there is a history and we're not the only ones, we're not the only cities that do this, I think we're one of the few that's doing it like this. When the Eighth Court of Appeals ruled that I had the right to go forward, I heard from other municipalities and other utilities that are like, hmm, we better be careful about what we're doing. The Texas Municipal League has a whole presentation that they make to elected officials on this very subject of being careful of how you generate these fees so they're not taxes. I think the city fell right into what you're not supposed to do. What is the role of the Public Service Board, the PSB, in this debacle? We have a PSB, uh, which is very powerful. Right. They've been around since the 1950s. Yep. By law, the mayor is one of the people on the PSB. Yep. The others are professionals and citizens who know something about water or any way how to read a, a balance sheet. Well, what is the role of the PSB in this? None. And it gets convoluted because the PSB probably takes some of the heat or calls generated by the public because when you get this in the mail or online, it says El Paso Water. The fee over here on the garbage side is an action of the city council, but El Paso Water has been charged with collecting it. So I'm not going to blame the Public Service Board for that. Right. I believe that their rates are too high. The $1.33, 
And again, I don't want to confuse your viewers too much, but that $1.33 wasn't created by PSB either. That was created by the city council to be charged on that side of the bill. And I know that they get comments about that all the time. This is a legislative slash administrative issue on the yes. city side, is what this is. And there, I, mean, there, I mean, PSB is a whole other story. When they started this uh, opt-out last year, um, and I think their success rate is huge, uh, you got sent a letter that said, if you don't call us up and not tell us to charge you, we're going to charge you 98 cents a month. And so most of El Paso's ratepayers are also paying a dollar a month for this insurance policy that uh, PSB is collecting. That's a whole other story. Right. That's a whole other story. Where and I've opted out of that. I'm only, maybe maybe you have. There's probably only oh, two no, or I've, three I've, of I've opted out. I mean, this is 98 cents that I think the, uh, they want to charge us for sewage. Leak protection. Leak protection, leak on, protection. Our, on our sewage conduit, right? Leak, leak, no, leak protection for the water going into the property. For the water coming into the property. Right. And okay. again, that's something that should have been figured in our rates. The city council should weigh in on those kind of things. And again, I'm very disappointed, even the people that I like and support it and will continue to support, but they're not asking enough yeah. questions. It ends up as a fee that we have to actively opt out of. Yes. Otherwise, we're automatically charged it and most people aren't, aren't even going to be aware. And again, it's millions of dollars because it's one individual or one family where somebody's responsible for paying the bills and going, oh, 98 cents, dollar thirty-three, six dollars. Oh, I don't like it, but what do you do? And again, they're not looking at the big picture where it's allowing uh, the city council to take advantage of us collectively. Right. Now, I want to broaden this conversation a little bit and talk more about the global picture. This fee is part of a general trend, right? Mm -hmm. Under Tommy <clears throat> Gonzalez, our city property tax was raised nine years in a row, okay? The no new revenue rate was not achieved for nine years until this fiscal year with the new city council. Finally, we have a no new revenue rate and no tax increase, but nine years of tax increases. We also had record debt issuances. We, we currently owe $851 million in principal and interest on certificates of obligation. That's 10 certificates of obligation, uh, $851 million is more CO debt than the five largest Texas cities combined, all of that issued without voter permission. And for what? For a lot of things. Road repair, which is, which is supposed to be in the general fund, but also cost overruns on entertainment projects. Mm -hmm. Children's Museum, Mexican American Cultural Center, uh, and, and other projects that are really not supposed to fall into the CO category. COs are supposed to be for emergencies. That's how they were conceived, and that's the guidance by the Texas Comptroller. So we have all of this uh, borrowing, all of this spending, uh, driven a lot by, by huge capital projects. Now, I've written a lot about the oligarchy. You have a colorful term, the Illuminati. Right. We're talking about a couple dozen families that traditionally have called the shots, uh, who have for a long time um, controlled the city and county and managed to ram through uh, their priorities. This includes large capital projects that benefit certain local industries. This includes 380 agreements, TERSs, TRZs, and other vehicles that, that amount to hundreds of millions of dollars in tax forgiveness, right? Abatements, incentives, and so on and so forth, to the point that now homeowners pay a very high percentage of the property tax burden. Whereas in other cities, it's the commercial sector that pays more than 50% of the property tax burden. We're upside down, we're in reverse here. And then when you couple that with the fact that our population in a city is actually declining, we've lost over 6,000 people net-net since 2017, we're on a very worrying trend here. And I'm wondering, Joe, if you could, if you could comment on that. Tell us a little bit, bit about uh, the power structure here in El Paso from your standpoint, having served on city council, having served um, for many years uh, in the state legislature, you have a very, you have a lot of experience and you've seen a lot of this over the years. Am I correct? I believe you are. And my experience or the effect 
besides being spending 24 years in the legislature, um, I'm a real estate broker. I uh, have bought some small commercial properties over the years trying to earn a living for myself and my family. And the current property tax structure, and some of this falls on the state of Texas too. I don't want to uh, just beat up only on the city of El Paso or the county. But the property taxes here are so high that I started to sell the couple of small properties I have because I can't afford to do it anymore. And I lease to small businesses. I lease uh, to a couple of young uh, ladies who do a training facility. I lease to a young gentleman who does a uh, cabling contract company. And in the last two years, I've had to increase the rates and pass along uh, the property tax increases. And it's hurting me, it's hurting them. And a few people that are in the same position as me are deciding that they're going to sell and build or buy or create 30 miles to the west in the state of New Mexico where uh, taxes are about 1%. Yeah, a lot of El Pasoans have been moving to Santa Teresa, Sunland Park, and Las Cruces. Uh, if we look at the latest census figures, uh, the city of El Paso, uh, our population grew between 4 and 5% since 2010 but since 2017 has been declining, whereas the state of Texas has between 15 and 16% population growth across the board in the same period. And if you look at New Mexico, Santa Teresa, Sunland Park, Las Cruces, double digit um, population increases, mostly El Pasoans escaping our property tax in order to and I, survive. And I don't, I don't have a, a crystal ball could tell you when it's going to finally be because I know you use this term tax revolt. I don't know uh, when that's going to happen, but I do know that people who are um, educated and are trying to make a living uh, as a small business in this community, it's getting difficult. There are some things that hinder it on the state side. I said I don't want to let the state of Texas out of it either. Several years ago, while I was in office, we limited that the increases on your homestead to 10%, even if your property goes up 20%, the most that you can be assessed is a 10% increase in one year. The downside to that is um, if your property goes up a large percentage or huge dollar amount and you try to uh, dispute this at Central Appraisal District, it's like, well, but it's only 10%. But it's eaten up over the next five, six, seven, eight, ten 10 years. So what's wound up happening is that it's going up 10% every year. Last year, the Texas legislature passed something, and I voted for it because I had to, as far as being a small business person, when I say had to, because there is a short-term benefit, but I see another long-term problem. The state of Texas now has mimicked that for commercial property. So, Max, if you own something that's $5 million or less, it's going to be limited to 20%. And that sounds good on the surface because every time I get assessed on one of my small properties, they're literally small. Um, I built them myself. Uh, they're a metal building from a company called Mueller that's out in Anthony. This, the Central Appraisal District likes to hit me with a 100 to 140, 150% increase in the particular year. So that would be limited going forward. But now, as a business person, I have to decide whether it's worth fighting now. Yeah. If it goes up 150%, you kind of have to. If it goes up 20%, now it's going to be, mm, it's going to cost me to hire an attorney, to file a suit. Central Appraisal District doesn't want to go to court. They're not like the city of El Paso. They will talk to you. They will at least settle right. um, on something like that. So long term, I think it's going to have a, a, an effect. It's funny how big, big, big business. Let's go beyond the, the couple of dozen families that you mentioned in Illuminati here. The Amazons of the world. They came in without anybody knowing. They didn't ask for anything. 
how many more of those are out there? Not very many. Um, I, I worry for, for, for my kids, you know, what are they going to be paying in, in property taxes? Are they going to be able to um, survive 10 years from now? You know, this year, as you mentioned, and I do thank the city for holding the line. I think you might see that happen, you know, during an election year next year, they're going to try to hold the line. But they're still so far ahead, they'd have to hold the line for the next 10 years right. to make it worth it. Let's, let's talk about this a little bit. We have five taxing entities, right? City, county, UMC, EPCC, and school district. That's our property tax. The city portion of our property tax was 25% when Tommy Gonzalez assumed office, and by the time Tommy was fired a year ago, 29%. Max, I can tell you that a decade ago, and you were really good at looking up the numbers, I think the city's portion of the taxes were less than 20%, probably between 15 18% of our tax bill, because I noticed they're using one of the um, visual aids that I came up with years ago in the legislature, using a dollar bill and splitting it for transportation dollars. The city has gotten outrageous, uh, even though the education side is still the most expensive and you have the least amount of control, you'd think that the city and the county, having local elected officials that you can see in the grocery store or sit next to in the multi-billion dollar stadium, would respond better, but they don't. Right. I mean, now that we have Brian Kennedy and Joe Molinar and our Fiero uh, on city council, uh, strong allies of the mayor, of course. The pendulum is swinging in the other direction. And for the first time in, in a decade, we do not have a tax increase and not one single dollar of debt will be issued this fiscal year. And now interim city manager, Kerry Weston, uh, is working already on fiscal year 2025 and trying as hard as he can to not raise our taxes for a second year, which would be unprecedented. Two years in a row of no tax hike. However, the city is saddled with $600 million in bonding that by law it has to go forward with. And so next year they have to issue $150 million in bonds and probably $150 million for four yeah, years in a row. I, just to interrupt you, when anybody says they have to by law, I used to love going places and being asked to speak and sometimes I'd be there and there'd be attorneys. Hmm. And they'd have their shot at it. They'd tell me what the law is and I'd say, yeah but I can change the law. Well, no one has attempted to change the law. They just tell you what it is and can't be. It's like, wait a minute. If, if you really want to be fiscally conservative and don't think you should be issuing all that money, then go change the law. You're exactly correct, and I'm glad you said that because uh, this 600 million comes primarily from the two big public bonds. The 2012 Quality of Life Bond, 473 and a quarter million, and the 2019 Public Safety Bond, 413 million, and there are about $600 million left to bond. And the bond indentures of both of those issuances um, have provisions in them that allow you not to issue the debt under certain circumstances. And so actually the city does have that power to not issue the debt. And, and again, you mentioned names that uh, I support and think are doing a, a, a better job um, than some of the others. They still need to ask more questions themselves. We took COVID money. Uh, we've taken federal money for migrants. And what do we do with that? Just a few hundred feet from where you and I are sitting is this Montana expansion project that goes from Yarville to 375 and then we'll go under 375. That project was not really necessary. That was kind of the former district engineer's homage to, to uh, the relationship we had with Fort Bliss and the right of way. But the city has taken federal funds. There's a six mile running track for no one. There's, there's not a single residential property on that six miles. The city has two park and rides that will never see cars parked there. And what will we use federal money? Yes, but there is a match to that. And then there's always that uh, maintenance. It's like the trolleys. You know, I kept telling everybody, this is a bad deal. Oh, but this is, you're just not progressive enough. You're not, 
wait, 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 wait. There's a way to do it. You just did it wrong. The Illuminati said, we want a trolley to go back and forth so in case ESPN gets a shot at the ballpark. With that money we got, now the city is losing anywhere between three and five million dollars a year. Nobody knows for sure because everybody's afraid to ask. Yeah, they're so happy to get a hundred million dollars for the project, but then but the now maintenance it's in, and operation now costs. Perpetuity. It's like Tommy Gonzalez took this money and they bought like five buildings with COVID money. Okay, you bought the building, but it's like the dog catching the bumper on the postal truck. And they run empty. What do you, what do, you do with them? You still have to right. pay for them. You've got utilities, you've got expenses, you've got overhead. I mean, and, and, and I wish the city would really employ more of an internal auditing system or the old days when I was growing up, the, the you know, somebody would go around in offices and turn down the thermostat two degrees and found out that in a building that's got 150,000 square feet, they saved, you know, $500 a month. The city doesn't do that. Nobody looks at the contracts that they have for resurfacing the streets. Now, instead of just resurfacing the streets, they get a good old boy contract, they sit there and they break up the curb and gutter because they make more money and it's a waste of time. Mm. I mean, we go on and on. <laughs> Nobody's asking any of the questions and they need to be asked because of going back to me and my lawsuit with the $6. It's the volume, it's the masses that they do. There's so much work that the city has to offer. So many things that they, they do. When I had to go down and get my permits and inspections for building my little buildings, you know, you have to go to this one and that one. I mean, City Hall is still split up in different locations. I mean, who, who does that? How efficient is that? When some of the own employees themselves can't speak to other employees, you don't even know them. Right, when City Hall is demolished, a uh, $14.5 million asset, for a ballpark that is still losing over four million dollars a year, right, it has to be met with subsidies. The city was then split up into, I think, seven different locations at this point. But I don't want to seem come across as no, 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 because if it's like you ask, would you like, would you support a ballpark? Absolutely. But give me some better choices instead of just being told. You know, we have one of the highest taxes on rental cars and hotels in the entire state, if not the country, because of that as well, too. And that affects us. And there's just so many, you start pulling at that thread and again, ask the questions. And I don't want to necessarily put all my friends on the spot, because I do consider some of the elected officials my friends. They still don't ask enough yeah. of the questions. You said something earlier that was kind of scary to me. Carrie Weston is putting the budget together. I personally like the gentleman. But the city council needs to take a hold of this and don't ask just one or two questions. They need to dig. They need to dig and they need. I had the best teacher in the world when I was in the legislature. His name was Rob Janelle. Rob Janelle became a federal judge. When I got put on appropriations, he said, okay, pick it. You go out <clears throat> and all these agencies that are under your purview, just walk in there. Don't be a stormtrooper, but you need to learn what it is that they do. Go in and ask them, what is your name? What do you do here? Find out what is necessary, what's not necessary, and know the answer to the question before you ask the question. That's not the case anymore. Our city council is told what to do. Even now, with Tommy Gonzalez being gone, unfortunately, they're still just, the, the culture is still there. It's right. still being not run by elected officials. When I call an elected official and they tell me, dial 311. Huh? Right. Dial 311. So, so, Joe, I have uh, two big questions I want to ask you before we, before we conclude. Um, so the city, it's not on a perfect path. There are problems. Questions are not being asked. Your lawsuit is digging up all kinds of worrying concerns here, right? Um, the county, on the other hand, is going off the rails, right? We just had our fifth salary hike yeah. since 2016. The commissioners now earn 89% more than they did in 2016. Um, they went for the rollover tax rate, which is the highest tax rate possible without putting it to the voters. Right. And we now have learned that they're going to issue a half billion dollars in bonds, including 150 million in COs in the short term, right? Um, UMC is going to build a new hospital campus that's going to cost hundreds of millions of dollars. 
EPISD is going for another big multi-hundred million dollar bond. When you add all of this up, plus the 600 million that the city still has to issue, we're talking about somewhere between a billion and a billion and a half dollars in bonds over the next several years. And already we have the highest property tax in Texas. We have the highest hotel occupancy, occupancy tax in the United States. Our state delegation was just about to raise our vehicle registration fees to the highest in the state of Texas. Tax, tax, tax. What do you think this does, Joe, my first question, for our competitiveness? Um, what, what are the effects of all of this taxation and all of this bonding on our community from your standpoint? I think it definitely hurts our competitiveness, especially with, uh, again, the proximity to New Mexico. People are still going to choose <clears throat> El Paso. Um, I'll, I'll give my family, for, for an example, my son, his wife, and their kids, my daughter, her husband, their kids, they want to live here. So they're gonna hold out. When I say hold out, they haven't told me we're to the point where we're gonna move. This is where they want to be. I think in the very near future, and that's probably gonna be within 10 years, believe it or not, that it's a short time. I think they're gonna start thinking, is there something better out there? Um, I'm tired of fighting Central Appraisal District unreasonably, and that goes back to the state, not the city. But the, the property taxes, city and county here, are the ones that we have so much control over, and we don't. When I say we don't, you know, you've got to vote, you have to ask the questions. I understand how busy people are these days, how many things that they're pulled at, social media. I'm still behind the times because I just don't do social media at, at this point. Um, so how do you get people motivated to, to ask those questions, get out and vote? That's the reason I got involved in politics. You know, every politician says they're not a politician. And I was upset 30 some years ago because I was like the lawsuit. I called up my city representative at the time to ask a question about why we do this, why don't we do that. Could get no answer, so I ran for office. I don't know how many of those people are, are out there. The ones that are <clears throat> running for most offices, not, not, not everybody, There'll be somebody that I support for mayor. There'll be somebody I support for county judge when that comes up. But it just seems that um, it's, it's just to take care of a base, to take care of um, the Illuminati. You know, I look at the far east side of town and see how it's been ruined. And the Illuminati, the oligarchs as I call them, they're not affected by high taxation no. like, like your ordinary El Paso. Not at all. Not at all. And, you know, people have tagged me over the years because it's not a secret that uh, I collect antique cars. And when did you start, Mr. Pickett? When I was 16 and was without one and had to walk to Sears when I was working for $1.75 an hour. And it was over decades and decades. I didn't go to uh, Barrett Jackson Auction in Phoenix, Arizona with my unlimited checkbook and create a uh, collection overnight. And I treated it like my real estate. I would buy a car, fix it up, and, and sell it. I've worked hard for what I have, and I might not be here if it wasn't for my family wanting to live in this community because of the connection with my, uh, my son, my daughters, grandkids. But there's going to be a point um, where it's going to push back. I mean, again, the numbers when the city has to create an $8 fee because they can't get it with a $2 fee because there's not enough people to charge it to, then it's gonna really come back. Well, when our population declines by a thousand people a year, net net, um, and the city is still bonding these gigantic projects and actually expanding outwards well, into new developments. Well, you know what really bothered me? It's a death spiral, isn't it? Politics, our, our, our state delegation, we went from five to four, and not a single one of them fought. Right. And, and, and our state delegation shrank by yeah. one house member because our population can't keep up with Texas. Well, that and there, we have no clout. I mean, and I, you know, you can say, you know, I'm 
bragging, or it wouldn't have happened if I'd been there. We got one senator and three house reps. What was the uh, district you represented? Well, at that time, it was 79, which 79. has now been changed. Right, they've been redistricted. In any case, uh, the state delegation for a long time has been in the hands of the Illuminati. Is that fair to say? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I get, I mean, I still get, I mean, I'm either uh, uh, love or hated, um, and I don't get along with with that side very much, even our current delegation, and it's, it's too bad. Um, I was given an awful lot of responsibility and clout when I was in the legislature, and I get to brag because my mom's not here. Right. I've held more chairmanship positions than any member of the El Paso delegation going back to when Ari Thomason was Speaker of the Texas House. Right, and this brings me to uh, the final area of our discussion, which is transportation. Mm -hmm. So the state delegation, our state senator, Cesar Blanco, as well as uh, our three House representatives, pushed hard to raise our vehicle registration fee to the highest level of the 254 counties in Texas. We were gonna have the highest fee. Uh, and the Republicans pushed back and killed it, okay? Well, we, but the, but the clear, fact that they were, but the fact that they were pushing for it. Yeah, but be clear, it wasn't the Republicans here. In they Austin, wanted it. It, right. was, it was the Republicans, mostly in the Senate, that right. didn't want to have to uh, answer to why they voted for that in their own district, even though it was only for El Paso we would have been the highest. We're already now, there's five counties of the 254, which we are one, that do have the highest. Okay, but explain this. So uh, there was a push, it failed, thankfully, but there was a push to increase our vehicle registration fee. Another $10. And that would have made it possible <clears throat> to bond large infrastructure projects yes. that the Illuminati wanted, correct? Yes, one of the reasons that that was even thrown out there is uh, we're all forgetting something that, that happened kind of recently in July. We were going to have a toll road in El Paso, the Border Express. Right. And without any push, except for some of us behind the scenes, the mayor and city council didn't openly object to it, the county didn't object to it, um, but the Regional Ability Authority here that contracted with the state of Texas to operate the toll couldn't afford to operate the toll. The real reason behind that whole project was hoping there would be enough revenue coming in to be able to parlay that into borrowing money. You mentioned the Public Service Board, bonds, they kept issuing bonds, having to have the revenue, more bonds, more revenue. But let's more let's bonds, make that clear. Revenue. When you have a revenue stream, you whether it's from the vehicle it. registration fee right. or or a tax reinvestment zone or a toll, when you have that revenue stream, even if it's only tens of millions a year, you can then go for bonds. Right. And the simple again and now now you're borrowing yeah, and hundreds of millions this, of dollars. Yeah, the simple is ten to one. And so the, the hope was that there was gonna be a surplus that there was going to be this revenue coming in from the tolls but to operate a toll road is like a business and the state of texas had done a traffic revenue study that the regional mobility authority was, was part of and just kept going on kept going on kept going on and they just couldn't pull the trigger if they had gone from flashing zero to a dollar dollar fifty whatever all of a sudden they would have to start operating it, which means there was people sending out bills in a back room that they call it. And there wasn't going to be enough money to operate it. There's some other um, real seedy technicalities to that too. That whole project was questionable financing to begin with. And the state of Texas has a secret number written down in case the state got sued. The state it was possible the state of Texas was going to get sued for that project, and we, the state of Texas, could have been fined $138 million because of the bonds that the federal government had issued as part of that project. Right. And, and the deck plaza. I want to talk about that now. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, there's a project underway driven by TxDOT and politicians and developers to widen I-10 on the downtown El Paso why? and to build frontage roads no, I'm asking on both sides. You're asking me why? Why? You're, you're, you, you travel it. Why? Do we need to widen there? Is it congested there? Is it congested near Bassett Center? Is it congested near Executive Center? Or is it congested right there? Not really. Not particularly. And in any case, just, you know, it seems that you can add a lane in each direction without actually widening the, uh, the corridor. You can do a lot of things. Yeah. So they want to do this. It's going to be an immensely ex expensive undertaking. Um, they do need to do some work on the bridges. We're told that the bridges are failing after 50 years, and, and you know, those need some work. But uh, the Illuminati want to build a deck plaza, a huge platform on top of the freeway, and then to build parks, amenities. There's been talk about a soccer stadium. And I'd be all for it if it was their money. Exactly, exactly. And the problem is we've now learned that the state of Texas will give nothing towards that project. And yet, uh, the powers that be are still talking about it. And my understanding is that to build a deck plaza would cost somewhere in the area of a half a billion dollars. The state of Texas, I've heard that, Max, but the state would put money into it. You think so? Not because the state um, would have done a broad comparison of projects, the state of Texas defers. And if our local metropolitan planning organization that the city is part of, the county is part of, the transits are part of, if that organization supports it, which as far as I know, do support it, then the state of Texas would Go like this and say, then we do too. The way our system works is you have these regions of which this planning area also does include part of New Mexico, but we don't spend their money, they don't spend our money. But if this organization supports it and it's in their plan, the state of Texas will support it. Interesting. But the taxpayers are going to be on the hook for yes. something. <clears throat> It's not well, going to be pocket change. <clears throat> no, what happens, Max, is you don't get something else. We should have done the Northeast truck bypass years ago. Um, it was in the pipeline even when I left. There was a project that should have come uh, sooner than later <clears throat> when we did the improvements to Fort Bliss to help expand Fort Bliss. That was the first project of its type in the entire state. That was a private contractor that under the laws at the time was allowed to go to the state and say, we will bond it and you will pay for it. The state accepted that, but then came in and said, we'll also pick up the payments for that. And that was a way for our community to get more transportation dollars than we normally did. When I left office, there was a plan to, to now, those bonds have been paid off by the state, not us. And because you're in the habit of that, it's about 31 million a year, I couldn't get anybody here locally to go back to the state and say, hey, do it again build the Northeast Bypass, we'll even let the Regional Mobility Authority bond it, but you pay the, the bonds. Right. That would be the only way to do it. Nobody did that. Nobody did that, yeah. So, so now everything is like um, cash is king, and if we do a project like that, because it is supported uh, by our local transportation group, we don't get something somewhere else. Just like the trolleys. People yeah. think, well, that was free money. You know what? You know what the state did? They reduced our federal funds by $100 million. Nobody knows that. Wow. Oh, we got it. We got $100 million above and beyond. This is extra money. No, because the state of Texas just said, we're just not going to give you $100 million in federal funds for other things. So, anytime, so we got nothing. 
Right. So anytime these, <laughs> these politically driven projects get done, we still lose somewhere else. There is there is a lot so of zero sum game. Right. There is you know construction going on. It's good to have you know contractors. I don't care where they're from. They're going to spend money locally. They hire people. They buy stuff. All those products are good for our uh, economy. Um, but let's pick good projects instead of bad projects to suit our our, our needs. Now, this this city council, uh, by the way, as as you're well aware, voted to kill TRZ two, TRZ two tax reinvestment zone or transportation reinvestment zone two, which I'm okay with, which was an incentivized corridor along I ten. Yeah, you and I may 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 finally have something to disagree with because I created those. Ooh. <laughs> I'm actually disagreeing with you about something. Because but, the way it was created, I, I actually, it was historic. I killed the bill. This was back in the days when it wasn't so partisan and you could make a great argument uh, like you, you know, could in debate class. And I got up and I killed the bill. And then I sat and I rewrote it. Uh, and to this day, I'm very proud of it. And the reasons that you just gave, though, make me believe what I did was correct because... The city did cancel it with a vote. That's what I wanted. Right, so it functioned the way you intended, yes. but just so we're clear, so our, so our viewers understand, TRZ2 was an incentivized corridor along I-10 through downtown. And basically, if I understand correctly, the properties on both sides of the freeway uh, contributed some of their property tax revenue to a fund, which could then be bonded to the tune of something like $300 million for other projects, is my understanding. And the city had to pay a little over $40 million to buy that out and cancel it, and now it's gone. Right. And my understanding also is that the Illuminati, as you call them, went ballistic. They were so angry. That's, why, why were they so pissed? Because that was another thing that I put in there too, was that once it was paid off, it had to go away, which is not what tolls are. And again, I'm bragging. I'm the only person that's ever legislatively done away with a toll. We had a toll on Cesar Chavez. That was pushed by uh, an El Pasoan part of that group, and I was against it. There was no bonds to repay. It was the only toll road in the state of Texas that didn't have bond indebtedness. So why are we even collecting a toll? So I changed the law. I did away with it. The TRZ has to have a project but the only way it works anyway is if these properties that you're speaking of have a natural increase because of their value. It can't be anything that's existing. Let's say uh, a property you own is worth $200,000. The city can create a transportation reinvestment zone. And if that property is worth $210,000, the city collects the tax. The incremental difference right. between two hundred dollars so and two ten. dollars The, the $10,000 difference, property tax portion, is separate and goes towards those bonds that you mentioned. Exactly. Absolutely. Right. And it doesn't affect residential property. But it was very hard to explain, and when I passed it, I had to go get the right-wing Republicans, and I had to, I traveled all over the state and sat down and, and had to explain um, that, and it was, a, it was a, a great experience. But they also found out that in the right hands, but Max, this is what, you know, People who are Second Amendment rights. This is people who use tools. Yeah, tools are in the wrong hands. We're not disagreeing. Yeah, we're just we're, it's just tools in the wrong hands. Because but you I'm and glad, I don't disagree about that. I'm glad, I'm glad the city. Did, <laughs> I'm glad the city did what they did. And the reason that had uh, it was it was when both two different governors, Rick Perry, had come to me and asked me if I had an idea, and I did. And it was one of the biggest constitutional amendments that I ever passed. And then when um, Greg Abbott became governor, he said. That was huge, what you did. You have another idea, yes. Um, and we did that constitutional amendment. But this TRZ one, it's like when you were talking earlier about good times, bad times, you know, we have a lot of debt, taxes, we're looking for money. That was one way if you used it correctly. But I did put several poison pills in there, just like we're the only 
area in the entire state of Texas that has a regional mobility authority that can be taken over by the city council. They have regional mobility authorities in different parts of Texas. I didn't know that. The city actually has the power to take it over. I put that in the law. Good for you. <laughs> no one else has that. There's not another regional mobility authority that's been created in the state of Texas that has that ability. This one does. Is it just a simple majority vote of city council to get it that is. done? It is. And it's not necessarily something that needs to be done. But it's there. But it's there. It's a sort of Damocles. If they get out but, of line, they can be taken But over. I don't know that they would do that. <clears throat> a lot of people don't realize. Is that a kind of receivership option? No, it's not. It's not that. It literally just means that the city council, just like they are the transit authority. Right. There are occasions when the city's meeting, but it's not meeting as a city council. They're meeting as the transit authority. Okay. For some metro. So just sort of coming to the crux of everything, we've talked about a lot of different things. A this lot of it go on for hours. Uh, we can talk to you all day long. A lot of it having, having to do with illegal fees, which are actually taxes. Uh, projects that are not necessary, tolls that are not necessary, bonding that is not necessary, and behind the curtain are some powerful individuals who are just driving this. And these are people who are from El Paso for the most part. And my, you're some good people. And, and my question to you, Joe, I is, trust them with my pet. I'm not sure I trust them with mine. <laughs> There's our disagreement. But <clears throat> why are these people doing this to us, the taxpayers. I gotta come up with 3.12% of the value of my home every year and struggle to do it. And maybe in a few years I'll be paying 33 or 3.4%. Why are they doing I, this to I me? Think, I think it's an argument that nobody can win. I really think they believe they're doing the right thing because the rest of us are not progressive enough, intelligent enough to think on our own and do it. And so then the rub becomes hardened and the standoff gets more so it's been a long time since i've been able to sit down with persons like that um another hour we could talk about the real history of the medical school that's going to be part two i know exactly how, <laughs> how it happened and, and i created some monsters during that because uh, I had to wheel and deal again. I was chairman of general government appropriations when all that came down, and there had to be some local buy-in. Could Joe Pickett uh, offer forty or fifty million dollar buy-in? I couldn't do it. I I could not do that. Me couldn't do it. Mm. They have uh, a responsibility and a role, and a, a lot of times the powers used for, for good, a lot of time, power is, is not. And when you don't realize what the outcome is, again, it's, it's a dictatorship, which I'm not totally against. I used to go to political science classes and try to explain, I am a dictator, huh? I am a democratic dictatorship. What do you mean? I go out and ask for your support to get me elected. But once I'm elected, I can't get your feedback on the 10,000 votes I'm going to take in a 148-day legislative session. So I become a dictator in that sense. There, there are plenty of people. And I just think that there's some bad dictators. <clears throat> there are plenty of people who would not object to putting, you know, democratic and dictator in the same sentence. But, you know, you, you're a lifelong Democrat, okay? I'm a libertarian. Yeah. <clears throat> but you, you really are a blue dog Democrat. No. A uh, fiscally you know, conservative Democrat. You know, it's, it's getting, uh, it, it, it got very hard for people to label me. Uh, the Republicans, they would see me do something and then they'd make an offer for me to join their club. Uh, and if I had, then they would have just said, well, that's not what we thought. Uh, I did what I believe was, was the best. I'm very conservative. And yes, I am a Democrat. And I thought this was funny. I happened to see the sign in the post office the other day. When I was 18 years old, my dad took me down to the post office in the Five Points and we had to register. He said, register for the draft and register to vote. Final word, any plans to run for local office? Not at this time. Not at this time. I, I really, you know, I, I, I've got a lot of things that I'm involved in. I toyed with it. The boss in my relationship said, that's, that's too much time. I wouldn't have needed a lot. Um, had a certain city 
council representative had been recalled, I probably would have jumped in. Uh, and, and that would have been most welcome, by the way. I would have loved to have done a year. I don't need four years. Uh, I would like to set an example. I'd like to ask questions. Again, I, I had just great, great mentors and teachers in my uh, 24 years in the legislature, and I just think there isn't enough of that right now. Right. Um, so I mean, we have to we have to wind down. Let me just ask you, uh, Joe, is there anything you'd like to add before we conclude? Absolutely not, Matt. Okay. You should never ask that question yeah. after an MD. Didn't you ask me to ask that I question? I did. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Joe, look, it's been a, a pleasure. Uh, we've learned a lot from you today, and thank you so much for joining us uh, on air. All right. KMAX, right? Is that the name of your station? Uh, K you need, you need to go K-E-P-T-R. <laughs> K-El Paso Taxpayer. I think Bowl. you need to go get KMAX.com or dot, dot .org, dot .net, dot Whatever that is. I don't think I want to be that famous.